Hey, what's up everyone? Back here with another comic book review. This is Star Wars War of the Bounty Hunters Alpha. So it's basically the issue zero or just the alpha issue starting this event. This is the Star Wars event of the summer. I'm pretty sure I'm the last guy to review this book. Uh, but you know what? I, I can't help it. It's been on my mind and I really, really love this. It's almost like a feeling of being compelled to uh, show the many viewers watching this channel, uh, the great Star Wars comics that Marvel is putting out, uh, which is pretty much just the Star Wars Bounty Hunters and uh, now this issue uh, lately. But uh, this is going to be a short, sweet review because I'm pretty much just going to spend most of the time talking about the art, the great, fantastic art. Uh, but uh, uh, the story is pretty good too. But man, this, this issue is carried by the art. Really fun, really cool. So uh, this is Star Wars War of the Bounty Hunters. It was announced a little bit ago, kind of at a weird time, right when Disney fired uh, Gina Carano, and uh, they they announced some cool stuff, kind of weirdly, and it was it was a bit obvious that they were trying to have some good PR and try to speed up the process of uh, winning back customer confidence and getting people to forget about how uh, the company just betrayed all the fans by firing <laughs> Gina Carano. Um, and so it was, a, it was a little, when the news came out, even, even myself, I was kind of like, oh, whoopee. But, uh, you know, then I, I got more and more excited. I remember seeing this cover art, this image first on Steve McNiven's, uh, Instagram page. And, uh, he is a very big artist. He's top tier talent. Um, I've only, I've pretty much only seen his, uh, Marvel work. And the first things that come to mind, uh, when I think of him is doing the art for the Civil War event, which was probably the last really big, good Marvel event that was well-received. And then he did, uh, also with Mark Miller, uh, Old Man, the Old Man Logan story. And then he did a, a Captain America with Ed Brubacher, at least for a, for a time. And uh, pretty much he's just off and on. And I'm always like, I, I forget about him all the time. I'm like, where's Steve, where's Steve McNiven? What happened to Steve McNiven? And uh, he's such a detailed artist, he's probably just super slow because he's a perfectionist just by looking at his art. But this is a great picture. It's an homage to, to uh, Platt. I don't know his first name, it starts with an S clearly. <laughs> but it's uh, based off an old Moon Knight comic that Platt, Platt did the cover for in the 90s. He's in the same pose, and I would say McNiven uh, didn't just pay a good homage to it, he improved upon it. I love that he's got the Han Solo and Carbonite behind him and that he's holding his gun facing toward you in this cool pose. And I love the explosions adding to the chaos. So this is written by Charles Sewell, who is a pretty good writer, but he's really good on Star Wars stuff. He's writing currently the main Star Wars title, which is honestly probably his most boring Star Wars book yet, which is ironic because it's the main Star Wars title right now. Um, but he's done a lot of other Star Wars like miniseries that were really, really good. Uh, oh yeah, and his, uh, his, he did two years of a, a Darth Vader series, the second volume of Darth Vader, uh, of Marvel's Darth Vader. That was quite good. Uh, but, you know, pretty much, uh, uh, pretty much this takes place currently, I think all the Star Wars comics in the line right now uh, are taking place now between episode four and five. It's picking up basically right after, uh, five. did I say four and five? It takes, it's between five and six. So it's right after episode five, Han Solo just got frozen in carbonite, and that's going to be the MacGuffin of the story. And uh, it's kind of funny now that uh, Marvel was really holding off on using Boba Fett, probably because working with Lucasfilm, they weren't being allowed to. Uh, but then he appeared in The Mandalorian, and he was just awesome, and he's cool, and everyone loves Boba Everyone always loved Boba Fett, but now they, they're reminded of, of, of him again. And so now there's direction for the character. So it seems like now the Lucasfilm storyboard has allowed Marvel. Now you can use Boba Fett. Just don't touch anything to do with the Mandalorian or the book of Boba Fett or anything else we plan on doing with him live action. But now you can use him in this kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. Uh, great, great shot of the Slave One. Cool shot of him looking at just uh, looking up down at the carbonated Han Solo. Uh, talking to Bib Fortuna, obviously he's going to collect the bounty on Han Solo and take him to Jabba. Then he starts noticing Han Solo is getting a little 
muddy and blotchy. I like that this starts beeping, he just starts clicking away at random buttons like he doesn't know what to do. And then he just says, nothing's ever simple. So something's going wrong, and then it's like, bam, there's the, uh, there's the uh, title spread. And uh, it cuts to Nar Shada, Smuggler's Moon. I don't know what this creature is called, I just call him Dexter's because uh, uh, Dexter Jetster was the creature of this same species that was uh, helping Obi-Wan in Episode 2. And uh, this guy can help repair whatever is uh, unstable with the carbonite freezing, uh, probably because humans weren't meant to be frozen in carbonite. Uh, but he'll do it for a price, basically. And because uh, Boba Fett, I, I guess he's kind of broke. <laughs> he's like, hey, I, I, I'll get the money later. This is Han Solo and I'll pay you double. I just don't have the money now. But uh, this guy ain't going to budge. So he kind of hires Boba Fett to do this. Just look at the detail work. Look at this guy's you know, mustache, the wrinkles around his eyes, his face. Really good stuff. All the line work around the carbonated Han Solo. Uh, reading Boba Fett's dialogue was a little weird at first because... Uh, I, I grew up uh, watching the original trilogy on the VHS tapes. I had the, the first special editions, the ones that came out in the 90s, and they still used Jason Wingreen's voice, uh, the original uh, Boba Fett voice actor. And he's got, that, he's got that really villainous, you know, that villainous voice. He's no good to me, Dad. He kind of this, kind of this uh, uh, he just has that kind of voice. And that's what I grew up watching. It was just imprinted on my mind. That's how I always imagined Boba Fett to sound. But then uh, with Tamora Morrison now being uh, uh, dubbed as the Boba Fett voice and, and cementing that even further by playing him in live action, which obviously makes sense because he's Jango Fett and Boba Fett is a clone of Jango. Uh, but uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of probably other people besides me or just younger people uh, won't remember Jason Wingreen's awesome voice. Uh, but uh, reading his dialogue here, like calling the guy Doc and stuff like that and being like, oh, oh yeah, uh, uh, about that, you know, and referring to the money. It's like that's stuff that I didn't imagine Jason Wingreen to say. Um, kind of, I don't want to say humorous, but with a certain personality. It's like this is this is Django Fett's personality. You know, he's a clone of Django. So, so then uh, very quickly I, I, I rewired my brain to then hear Tamara Morrison's voice because he, he is not quite as villainous. Um, I'm not saying that uh, Tamar Morrison playing Boba Fett uh, kind of uh, defused Boba Fett as a threat. Uh, he's still Boba Fett. He lived a different life as Jango. He's a little more gruff, I think, uh, because the because when Boba Fett's top dog bounty hunter, he's living in the, in the period of time where the galaxy has all gone to hell because the Empire rules everything. Um, but uh, he, he still very much speaks with that, uh, you know, he's got a little, he's kind of a, he's kind of a dog and a brute and a bounty hunter with a heart of gold. <laughs> That's what Tamora Morrison's uh, voice kind of brings uh, out of Boba Fett. You especially get that watching him share scenes with Din Djarin and the Mandalorian. You know, really good, uh, uh, really good use of body language, leaning over like that, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got to do this crap for you now. Uh, goes in, one of these creatures, uh, the singing, like the singing alien creature at Jabba's Palace in episode 6, and he's signing up for the tournament because the person that uh, this Dexter guy wants Boba to kill is the champion. Uh, very well protected, he can only get to her by fighting in the tournament, and since she's the champion, he's got to reach all the way to the final round and then kill her. And uh, he's like, oh man, this, this armor, it has a reputation, people will recognize it. And he was like, don't worry, I've got some, uh, got some space spray paint, <laughs> some Star Wars spray paint that'll disappear after a day. And uh, I, I turned the page and I was kind of like, oh, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? It's just black. <laughs> he just went, you know, he just said, does, does it come in black? You know, he pulled a Bruce Wayne and just spray painted them all black. So, you know, that's actually kind of a cool look after I think about it. Really heavy inking, really cool shot right there. And uh, instead of giving his name Boba Fett, he goes by Django. Not Django, but he's just going to go by Django here. Um, and uh, you can tell that approaching this arena battle, he's being reminded of his father. He's got his father on the brain. That's why he, uh, he chose the name Django to go by. He's probably going to fight for his father's honor. Has this one panel, just one sweet great panel of uh, recreating 
the final time we see young Boba Fett in episode two holding his father's head after Mace Windu chopped it off at, in, on the, uh, at the uh, arena in Geonosis. And uh, once again, call back to his father. So uh, looks like he's going to start taking his anger out. Look at this art. Look at this fantastic art. He keeps going for the head. With all these guys, he's fine. Blows that guy's head off, cuts his head off. And uh, he's just going, you know, totally, you know, just total brute mode, you know, beast mode over here. Look at the detail with this guy he's talking to. All the hair is coming out. You know, I'm gonna get into more detail with the uh, with the art later. But yeah, all these creatures look amazing. And I'm like, man, I've, I've actually never seen Steve McNiven uh, flex his creative muscles in this way before. And I realized I've never seen him do uh, something quite like Star Wars before. I've only seen him do Marvel superheroes. So I'm like, man, these creatures look amazing. Even that guy looks cool. <laughs> well, minus the getting shot <laughs> right, in, right in the forehead by Boba. But uh, just the detail work is cool. This guy's armor, his jet boots, it looks cool. Uh, it's like, I, I wish Lucasfilm, you know, uh, uh, for the movies and the shows, I wish they, con they contracted Steve McNiven. You know, it's reasons like this that I love comic books. It's a visual medium. We get to... We get to experience Steve McNiven's imagination, and he has a great one. We can see clearly he's got some he's got some chops with the design work. Uh, finally, getting to the final boss battle, the person that uh, he's going to kill is this awesome-looking spider lady. She's so grotesque, you know, so menacing-looking and just really creepy. But uh, uh, she has the advantage with this fight with all these platforms kind of strung together. Very easy for her to move around. And uh, even the door slams down here and he's like, great. He's got like this sarcastic kind of tone to himself. Uh, he can he can fly for a bit, shoots his, uh, shoots his four little dart things uh, uh, that we got. We finally got to see that used in Mandalorian too. That was awesome. And uh, gets in a good shot, tries to use the flamethrower. Uh, you see here, she's she's using. Uh, I, it's been a long time since science class back in school. I forget what that part of the body is called on a spider. But look at her elongated head right here. Look at the rows or the, the the pairs of eyes that she has. Shoots the webbing out of this thing up here on top, and uh, just so creepy. Grabs him by the jetpack, flings him around, sticks it over there. Now he can't fly anymore, and uh, he's got himself a. Uh, a vibro knife uh, that Mandalorians usually have those and cuts off one of her legs but she uses one of her other legs to stab right through him probably near the shoulder but still uh, going through the main chest piece and the back piece of his armor so that kind of confused me and I was like is that not is that not best car it should be impenetrable and uh, that, that was a little confusing but I let it go really quickly and uh, she is just look how creepy she is, those long teeth. She's just, that is the stuff of nightmares. She looks so cool though. I would love to see the, a creature of this species get the live action treatment from Lucasfilm. Please Lucasfilm, take notes. Like Steve McNiven, he's your man when it comes to some cool new alien creatures, you know? Uh, that was a big complaint of mine of the Disney trilogy of Star Wars. Right off the bat with episode seven, I was like, these new aliens aren't that impressive to me. George Lucas, had an amazing team. He himself had a great imagination to come up with cool looking creatures. And uh, where is that now? And Steve McNiven is definitely delivering. Anyway, Boba Fett notices that his jetpack, uh, the rocket on his jetpack, is kind of aimed downward right at the platform they're standing on. So he uh, kind of pulls a Norman Osborn and reaches for his uh, control panel on his arm. Uh, except unlike Osborne, he does it successfully and just blasts her with the rocket. She definitely takes the full brunt of that blow. You can see his body flying over there. And then uh, she's on fire. You know, she's burning alive, lands on the ground, gets smushed. <laughs> this actually made me literally laugh out loud because just the thought that they were both on a platform, then by the time they reached the ground, she went under the platform and then he landed on top of it. Like, I imagine that she land, she hit the ground first, platform landed on her, probably mortally wounded her, but then him then <laughs> landing on top of all of that made her go and just smushed her. 
So uh, that I don't know why that made me laugh. Maybe the fact that he even landed on his head and uh, even got him, uh, uh, if you can make sense of this panel, just you see his visor uh, getting mixed in with the rubble and the wreckage. Her arms are sticking out and he just goes, ah, <laughs> it's been a long day for Belba. And uh, goes back over here. She's all shocked and wide-eyed. And he goes, I won. I'll take my credits. <laughs> he looks like complete shit. He's got spider guts all over him. I even love that even uh, the antenna on his helmet is bent. So he just looks horrible. He's covered in blood. And uh, he's like, okay. Hey, I won. It, it kind of reminded me of the uh, second episode of The Mandalorian when uh, Din Djarin comes back with the furry egg from the cave. And he's like, I got it. He's, all, he's just exhausted. I got the egg. That's, this was the same feeling to me. And uh, cutting back over to the Dexter guy. Uh, he totally gets shot. Rando uh, bounty hunters are totally, you know, snaking the prize out from under Boba Fett. And uh, I was kind of like, this is War of the Bounty Hunters, right? So it should have been like Dengar or you know, a bounty hunter that we've seen before, or someone with a reputation. And then I was like, you know what, I kind of like their randos that we, we don't know who they are. It, it made the stakes even bigger to me, that this, this isn't just going to be the bounty hunters that we know. This is the war of the bounty hunters. The Han Solo is the mother of all uh, rewards right now because the bounty job I put on him is so big. So everyone wants a piece of that. Everyone, even the nobodies. So uh, comes back over here. The black spray paint, spray paint uh, wore off of Boba Fett and he comes over. Uh, Dexter's dead. I know I keep calling him Dexter. That is not Dexter Jetster from, from the diner in episode two. Uh, but he's dead. Han Solo's gone. Jabba and, and Bib Fortuna are calling up. It's like, hey, where, where's... You gonna deliver that, uh, that thing that we're paying you for or what? And he's just... Boba Fett, even though you can't see his face, you know he's just pissed looking. He's kind of face palming himself right now he's like it's gonna be a minute war of the bounty hunters <laughs> so that's how that's how it begins uh kind of a, a little letter here um of them i thought it was going to be like something important like the making of this comic since it was so fun and cool but it was pretty much just them trying to sell me this comic which is weird because i already bought it it's right in front of me uh, it's got a checklist of all this shit so they're really marketing this War of the Bounty Hunters to be the biggest uh, Star Wars event since Marvel got the comics rights back to Star Wars. And uh, I remember, though, that uh, the first crossover they did was uh, Vader Down in the first year, I think, of when they, when they started publishing the Star Wars comics again. And that was really good. It was so, like, a lot of people love it. It was very well received. A lot of people actually want Vader Down to get the, some live action uh, treatment going on because it was so good but what made it even better was that it was just an alpha issue like this that started the story and then it just crossed over between star wars darth vader star wars darth vader and then done five parts nothing to it i really wish that's what uh this story did of probably just bouncing an alpha issue and then bouncing between star wars and then bounty hunters star wars and then bounty hunters and then ended but they're they're it's it's Marvel now, you know, it's current year Marvels. So they're going to go full Marvel event with it and fatigue us with all this tie-in crap that we're not going to read. So uh, all this crap. So so this there's going to be this alpha issue and then the main series of Star Wars War of the Bounty Hunters 1 through 5. And then every other Star Wars book is going to tie into it. I'm not going to buy all this crap. I'm not going to buy the one shots they're making. I'm going to keep getting Star Wars and Bounty Hunters because I was already getting those books. Um, but I'm I'm not going to read Dr. Aphra and I don't think you're going to read Dr. Aphra because no one's reading Dr. Aphra. No one is reading Dr. Aphra. And I swear to God, I'm going to be able to read this story and I'm going to be fine without reading it. Um, you know, there, there, some characters are getting one-shots. Looks like there's going to be a, a, a Jabba the Hutt one-shot. And uh, it's like Jabba the Hutt, yeah, he's going to be integral to the story but he's not even a bounty hunter you know but there's going to be a it's going to be a four lom and zuckus one shot okay that might be cool you know ig88 one shot oh, okay you know but other than that it's like oh, you didn't have to go full marvel with it you know 
There's the cover for issue two. Looks awesome. Steve McNiven. He, he's only going to do the art for this alpha issue, which is a shame. But for the rest of the issues one through five of this War of the Bounty Hunter story, he'll be doing the covers. So, all right. You know, that that's cool. Steve McNiven will at least give me some glorious covers. Boba Fett looking like a complete boss right there, holding Forlom's head. So, uh, sorry all you Forlom fans. Look like Looks like uh, he's going to get it. But, uh, great, great issue. Great, solid, you know, just fun story uh, by Charles Sewell. It didn't really... Uh, it didn't really have anything to do, not much at least, to do with the story of War of the Bounty Hunters. This was just a Boba Fett issue. Boba Fett was the only one in it. And it was just a quick random issue of uh, of how he lost the Carbonated Solo, basically. And it had a lot of action in it because this arena competition had to ensue. And he got to reflect on his past and, you know, his father and stuff like that. So... You know, story-wise, it was pretty good. Art-wise, every page was just so pleasing to the eye. Every every page, Stephen Niven made it count. And uh, so, uh, even, even here, I forgot to mention uh, that it also showed us at the very end... Where, where did it go? Oh, I oh, guess I was imagining that. I was imagining it in... Because I also picked up this... <laughs> So yes, I got the director's cut of the exact same comic that I just bought. So yes, you can call me weird. I bought the same comic twice. Uh, this one's a dollar more. And uh, uh, pretty much just for the art. Just for the art. It's got this cool cover. I was confused by the cover. Why is it just Boba Fett in black armor with a spear? It's like, but then after reading the comic, it's like, oh, okay, it's actually in the comic. So you know you know the toy line like there's going to be a black series figurine of just <laughs> just black armor boba fett P possibly the name will just be uh, a you know, singular name Django, and uh that'll be really easy because then you know all you toy collectors you'll 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 get that it'll probably be a store exclusive or something and uh, all they have to do is use a pre-existing mold uh that they already created and just give it a do a new paint job this this uh <laughs> this black armor uh, also, really, too, I, I really love that uh, Boba Fett's usually seen using a rifle. For you super diehard Boba nerds, you can comment below and tell me what rifle it is. I used to know, but I forgot. But uh, in this, he's shown wielding a pistol. It's not the same. Uh, it's not the same pistol that his father Jango Fett used. It had kind of a different shape to the barrel. But this is uh, the same pistol that he was wielding in The Mandalorian. So really good uh, attention to detail and. Uh, uh, caring for continuity right there. So basically, in this director's cut, it's it's the same comic, but then uh, when it ends, oh yeah. So here's what I thought was was in the other one. It's showing the variant covers of pretty much the same the same cover, except uh, uh, this variant cover where everything's all red, looks really hot and warm. Lots of warm colors adds to the chaos. Then there's another variant cover of him on the cover with the black armor. So uh, that's kind of cool. Just, you know, that's something for the colorist to, to do, and they turned a variant cover into it. Uh, but anyway, so then what makes this a director's cut is because it got it has the entire comic again, but just McNiven's art. No color. No dialogue. And uh, I'm a, I was a big enough fan of McNiven's art in this comic that I was like, yeah, I do want to see. I do want to get a better, more detailed look at his art. It was that good. That's why I love comics. Uh, yeah, stories are great. But it's all about the art. It's all about the pictures, man. The pictures, the pictures. So just even look at that cover. Look at the screen. Look at all the lion art. Uh, Steve McNiven. I'm, I'm 100% sure he does his own inks. Look at, look at all that inking work that he had to do. Look how you remember in the first Thor movie, that glorious first Thor movie, when he's all angry at the beginning at the uh, frost giants making it that far into the vault, and he's like. Look how far they got! That's how I feel, except I'm saying, Look how good this looks! I'm saying it with that same amount of intensity. Look how good this looks! Look at the screen. See, you, you didn't get... You didn't see just how detailed he went in the, uh, in the finished product. Looking at just the art, you get a real sense of the time and effort McNiven put into this art. It looks so good. Even the Slave One looks good. You know, right there, 
even here too, I didn't, uh, I barely noticed that you see uh, the carbonated Han Solo's hand uh, reflection, reflecting in Boba Fett's visor because uh, you kind of focus on the red light on the side of the visor. Over here, there's no red light, no, nothing to distract. You just see the hand. That hand looks amazing. This art looks amazing. He drew in all the, 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 the flaking of the paint off of his helmet. Right there. That hand looks amazing. All oh, that looks so good. Once again, reflecting on the visor. Bib Fortuna, every wrinkle on his, on his disgusting face. It's amazing. Oh my gosh, look at that. All the wrinkles and, and bags under this guy's eyes. Ah, it, it's, it's just incredible that a, a person drew all this. So I, if you're a Steve McNiven fan, then it goes without saying. You need this director's cut. So it just looks amazing. All of that stuff. Please look at the screen. It's like, it's like he, he put so much love and attention into every single panel. Like before I was like, yeah, every page looked great. Now I'm like, every panel looks great. It looks like he spent the same amount of time on every single panel. Uh, that flashback Boba, uh, a young Boba Fett panel looks amazing. This fight scene, breathtaking. All the backgrounds, the kinetic energy. Look at all of that blood coming out of this guy's mouth as he's stabbing him with that spear. You know, look at the motion that Steve McDivin captures. Every wrinkle, you know, the shading to, to give the shape to that guy's, uh, to that guy's head. All the hairs uh, coming out of this guy's uh, mustache right there. Looks amazing. Oh my gosh, this spider creature looks so cool. That species looks so cool. Comment below. Tell me if that existed before. So that I, I make sure that I'm I'm giving because I'm, I'm giving Steve McDivin all the credit for for coming up with this cool spider creature. Maybe Charles Sewell said, "Draw me some draw me some sinister spider character," and uh, uh, you know maybe something that vague. And Steve McNiven just just you know came up with this amazing design. But I want to make sure I'm giving the right person credit. You know all the inking uh, around this this fire that he's uh, using his flamethrower to blaster with it's just such amazing stuff it's this this art is going to be timeless there's not a doubt in my mind that uh, you know people people can use this uh, director's cut thank god they put it out as an example for how to draw how to draw cool characters you know even here my favorite part splat <laughs> just <laughs> Yes, that is the sound effect that she made when she exploded, and uh, love that right there. Heavy inking, so much inking with the with the black armored Boba Fett. You get right here that moment where he says, uh, <laughs> uh, "Oh my gosh!" Even here at the very end with Jabba and Bib Fortuna. So it's like I, I didn't even I didn't even think I mean the the talk bubbles cover uh, so much up you don't even you don't even know I mean they leave they purposely leave space because they know where the talk bubbles are gonna go but it's like without that now I can see even the freaking ceiling looks amazing and I don't read comics for the freaking ceiling but that looks amazing and we have to mention it we have to talk about that that looks so good very pleased that reminds me too of uh, back back here a little when he's talking to that uh, alien creature and signing up for the tournament right there uh, got to see her eyelashes uh, curve and curl up and uh, that was kind of blocked by the talk bubble uh, in the finished product but uh, I don't know why I just I just liked being able to see like even that kind of attention to detail Steve McNiven uh, put her at this angle and just you know, gave her long eyelashes. I was getting, you know, I don't know why I like that so much that I, you know, seeing that made me go like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I got this director's cut so I didn't have to, so I, so that I could see how, how long her, her eyelashes are. It's like, it's, that's how much I love this art. So I really can't say, uh, can't say enough good things about it. Oh my gosh, I'm going on a half an hour now. I thought this was going to be a quick review, but I'm really just, I'm really just a, a lose my mind over this art. Even in this director's cut, you get a good, uh, uh, they show you the Lineal U variant cover, which is uh, pretty good, really good. 
The, the Neil Yu is really good uh, these days. Uh, he's mostly put on cover art duty. That's just a cool shot of Boba Fett swinging toward you. And then you get the John Ty Tyler Christopher action figure variant. Yeah, I, I, I know that that's going to be real. This isn't going to be a fake picture for long. <laughs> uh, kind of surprised me that uh, I, I haven't gotten a director's cut in so long. Uh, my first introduction to a director's cut comic was Moon Knight issue one back when I was a kid and I first got into comics and it was uh, something Houston was the writer for, for this Moon Knight. If you're a Moon Knight fan, you know what I'm talking about. It's like the best Moon Knight ever. And David Finch was the artist and the cover artist. And uh, it was a director's cut and it was the same cover, but then it would just start kind of blending and then uh, just turning in from the, the colored finish cover and then turning in about, about here into the uh, David Finch's pencils to let you know that it's a director's cut. But it uh, it didn't just go into detail with the art. It also was like giving you, um, it, I think it was kind of giving you like manuscripts of the writing and showing you the, pr the writing process of well, not just the art. Uh, so it kind of bummed me out that it, that wasn't in there, uh, that wasn't in this. So uh, maybe I just haven't seen uh, a director's cut in a really long time, but I didn't know that they were like that now. But uh, it was only a dollar more, and that, that just a dollar more for the same comic is really cool. Uh, it's pretty good. It was just a 20, standard 20-page 20 story, $4 comic. Uh, for an alpha issue, You, I would expect Marvel to make it a $5 book, but it was a $4 book. Pay 5 bucks though, and you get the whole story again, but you see Steve McNiven's amazing, beautiful art. So, uh, that is this review. I'm really, really looking forward to this event now. And you know what? Even if it sucks and it's just this overhyped, you know, boring, whatever, nothingness, uh, and the whole thing is just a load of bantha crap, I'm still going to have this alpha issue. I'm going to have this amazing issue that you can very easily disconnect from the rest of the story. I hope it's good, but this was amazing. Steve McNiven blew me away. Um, he's, I, I, Steve McNiven is such a great artist and I don't know if he even knows how good he is. He's that good. And, uh, you know, he's definitely made me into an even bigger fan of his. Uh, I will definitely be looking forward to the next time he does the interior art for a comic because I'll likely buy it just, you know, just cause he's doing the art. So, uh, uh, you know, Marvel comics, you know, just, uh, uh keep, uh, keep Steve McNiven on payroll and <laughs> give us more of his art, especially on Star Wars projects. It was great. So please subscribe to the channel. I know this video ran kind of long, but hopefully you enjoy my commentary on this stuff. And comment below. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think of Steve McNiven's art. Or give me your predictions of the War of the Bounty Hunters or how it's going to go. Or if you think it's just overhyped and overblown. So uh, I love starting conversations like that over these comics. So, uh, yeah, go, go out and buy this comic. <laughs> please, please go out and buy this comic, even if you're not a big old Star Wars fan or a big old Boba Fett fan. Uh, this was just a great comic, really enjoyable, really fun, and the art was fantastic. Uh, if there's a comic that's going to help us uh, boost our numbers so that uh, manga isn't the only thing making money <laughs> for as a visual medium, then comics like these, this, this, is, this should make everyone want to step up their game. So I love this stuff. Go support, go support this comic because it definitely deserves it. Thanks for watching. Bye.